If I see, if I even hear that you out on them corners hustling, I might have to kill you myself. Don't test your Uncle Tommy. There comes a time where people in the street game are pushed to the limit and where they have to make decisions that will alter the course of their lives forever. In episode 4, The Devil's in the Details, it emphasized the challenges and complexities that each drug operation in Chicago faces, especially under the constant threat posed by law enforcement. For Tommy and the CBI, they're now under constant surveillance and now find themselves with a huge issue on their hands, d first body, which will completely alter the way Tommy has to deal with him. Ironically, d first body was a corrupt cop, just like Tommy's other nephew, Tariq St. Patrick, who killed Ray Ray. For Jannard, his organization is on the brink, and you get the sense, there is no way back. For the Flins, Claudia and Vic are planning to make a daring move that we're all too familiar with in the Power Universe, but do they have what it takes to pull the trigger on a move that will completely shift the dynamics of Chicago's drug trade in Power Book 4 Force Season 2? Now, Jannard's life took a dark turn when he strangled Little K to death. The consequences of his actions, along with him turning to heroin, was a desperate coping mechanism. Taking this drug gave Jannard a temporary escape from all his problems, but that's all it was, a temporary fix. We witnessed a horror movie-like introduction to episode 4, with Jannard continuing with this downward spiral. Jannard's drug addiction, Little K's visions, and a mountain full of issues started to take a real psychological toll, and it really was about to get worse for Jannard. Bobby DeFranco found Little K's body at the end of episode 3. And even though Jannard's print would have been all over this murder, they haven't been able to connect it to Jannard just yet. His grandma ID'd his body but she refused to talk out of fear, so they had to find someone else who would. However, Bobby DeFranco wanted eyes and ears on the shark, Tommy Egan. So while Vargas and Rodriguez were on Tommy, the rest of them were going to target the CBI soldiers on the street. Now as law enforcement were keeping tabs on Tommy and Maria, one of the main questions when it comes to Maria I keep asking is, can Tommy trust her? She mentioned that she may have lied about her being behind a wheel before, and it was clearly evident the way she took on this train, which also lost Agent Vargas and Rodriguez. But it also raises another question, what else could she be lying about? Now I do think there was a huge clue that was dropped later in the episode which dates back to episode 1, but I'm gonna get to that later on. As they continued on their little date, Maria had eyes on these kids playing in the park, with Tommy saying he doesn't think kids are on the cards for him. This takes us back to power where Holly was pregnant with Tommy's baby, and no doubt, this would have sent him down memory lane. There are a lot of what ifs when it comes to Tommy's journey, and this is certainly one of them. Now this day was interrupted by someone clocking Tommy who was a part of Rojas's organization. He wasn't on board with the fact Rojas was working with the CBI as it was taking food off his table. But when you challenge someone like Tommy, you better come prepared. Tommy didn't want to kill this kid, but when you're in a situation where it's kill or be killed, you have no choice. The mirror shot was also a classic callback to power. He may have been living a civilian life with Maria moments before, but the reality is, when he looks in the mirror, all he'll ever will be is a drug dealing murderer and he can never hide away from who he is and what he has to do to survive. Now law enforcement were causing issues for Tommy in more ways than one in episode 4. They were putting the pieces of the puzzle together and realized Maria could be used to their advantage, but there was also someone else, Alicia from season 1. Bobby DeFranco was looking into the murder of Colin from season 1, a DJ that Vic Flynn killed and Alicia was a key witness. Let's not forget she saw both Tommy and Vic in 103, and with a nudge from Stacy Marks, she named Vic as a shooter, although she did stop short in saying whether or not she recognized Tommy Egan, maybe because he helped her along with Fat Tony, who could very well end up being a problem for Tommy in the future. Now in episode 3, one of the mysteries was Diamond was receiving calls and texts from an unknown number, which happened to be the returning Officer Bennigan. He was back to tax Diamond and as a reminder, Diamond's drugs back in the day was responsible for putting Seamus' sister in a state where she needs care for the rest of her life. He was here for 50k and looking on with confusion was Tommy Egan. He thought he was here to question him about a body that he just cut up, but Diamond threw him a lie around why he was really here, maybe because he wanted to deal with this himself, it was his problem and he had to deal with it. However, when Tommy caught him going into Seamus' car with an envelope and leaving empty handed, he thought Diamond may be a snitch and you can't blame Tommy Egan. The city was crawling with cops and he just witnessed CBI soldiers being roped up by the feds. He confronted Diamond warning him that in New York, they bury people like him. But Tommy couldn't have been so far from the truth and as Diamond told him exactly what happened, Tommy wanted to meet with Seamus to maybe work together and his lawyer Jenny Sue also said it wouldn't be such a bad idea to have someone within the CPD, especially because the CBI were firmly in the eyes of law enforcement. Now intertwining this story was also DMAC who wanted to get back in the game. He wanted to impress Genesis but also told Uncle Tommy he was wasting his talents. 
so it was only a matter of time before D-Mac made a very silly move with that gun, although the move that he made may have actually saved Uncle Tommy and Diamond's life. Seamus wasn't willing to play ball, and with D-Mac here to get a fresh fade for Genesis, he found himself pulling the trigger and catching his first body. D-Mac just killed a cop, albeit he was a dirty cop at some point, a missing Seamus will raise questions, and this is a death that will no doubt rock D-Mac's world, so what does Tommy do with him? Elsewhere with Diamond's story, Leon's mother caught his eye, and while he was giving him some boxing lessons, he dropped a little hint at his relationship with his father. Now, I previously said I don't believe in coincidences in power. They always drop family names for them to appear later in the story, and Diamond's parents is one we haven't heard too much about, so it is certainly one to keep an eye on. Over to Treason and Jannard's problems. He was being questioned by Bradley around little Kay, and he knew something just wasn't quite right, especially because of the scars on Jay's neck. But he also knew not to question Jannard too much because he is someone who is very unpredictable. He continues to get high on his own supply, he's stepping on product in ways it shouldn't be, and Mercury sent him a reminder his payment was due, so pressure was certainly building. Someone who has continued to have Jannard's back is Shanti, but just like Bradley, she could tell something wasn't quite right, and when he admitted to killing little K, she snapped. This is where Jannard threw her an ultimatum, she either rides with him or she doesn't, and we all know what Shanti's after, she's after that big reward. Although I do think she's slowly beginning to realise, Jannard isn't the guy to take the big risk on, especially because she knows he's on something. And sooner or later, I can see Jay ending up like Walter Flynn, losing the last person who's in his corner, especially as he continues to make bad business decisions. Something which you do not do in the street game is fuck with the connects money, and Miguel Garcia isn't someone to be messed with. We all saw what he did to his own soldiers who he thought sold him out to the Serbs, and he was close to taking Janard's left eye out so he could see right. But this is where I think it's worth mentioning Miguel's diabetes, which is the clue I spoke about earlier. Maria came to give him his injection, but she stormed out after the way Miguel spoke to her. Now why I thought it was worth focusing on this particular scene is because this could serve as Miguel's weakness. I questioned earlier can Tommy trust Maria, and I do think a test of loyalty will come at some point in season 2, so could this be one way she helps Tommy weaken her brother? It's definitely something to keep an eye on. Now, Jannard was facing a huge backlash from those within his own organisation. Similar to Chewie, those within Treason wanted some payback for Little K, and they were annoyed at the fact Jannard wasn't phased by it one bit. That was until he admitted to killing Little K. What followed was a battle between Jannard, Grayskull, and two others from his own organisation, and with Jannard outnumbered, he took one hell of a beating, but he didn't go down without a fight. This was also another stellar performance from Chris Lofton as Jannard, and no matter what many may think of his character, he is bringing the heat in terms of his acting. But in regards to Jannard and Treason, you can't help but feel this was a long time coming, and so it is nearing the end of Jannard's organisation, Treason. Moving over to the storyline with the Flynns, Walter had his back against the wall ever since the end of season 1, and he only has himself to blame. He had one last opportunity to make it right with his kids, and he squandered it by playing the same game he's always done, playing them against each other to get what he wants. If I were in Walter's shoes, I would have picked Claudia to run point on the deal with Michael, because we only have to look at what Vic did at the end of episode 3. He's destroying Walter Flynn's organisation from the inside, and like Claudia said later on in the episode, he's giving his father a slow death. However, Walter Flynn is certainly a wolf, he's never going to go down without a fight, and he certainly isn't going to beg, that's the complete total opposite of what he stands for. If he's going to go down, he's going to go down all guns blazing. So he asked Uncle Paulie to increase the rent on everybody they protect, which was met with some resistance, because Uncle Paulie knew this was the wrong move. One of the major question marks in season 1 was Uncle Paulie's loyalty, and it is a word that we have to use carefully in the power universe. For Uncle Paulie, the questions were, would he turn on Walter Flynn and speak to law enforcement, or turn his back on the Flynn organisation? However, let's just remind ourselves how loyal he actually is. I took an oath to the family. But I have a deeper loyalty to this family. He made an oath to protect and serve the Flynn family and he'll continue to do so. But despite Walter Flynn telling him not to speak to Brendan Doyle behind his back, he did exactly that. Although he did have Walter's best interests at heart, he gave Brendan Doyle an envelope to buy him some more time and said everything was on him. Although we all know that's not true, the mess that the Flynns find themselves in is all down to Walter Flynn and him alone. But as Uncle Paulie has built up a lot of respect with Dublin, Brendan Doyle does leave this meet by saying he would consider his ask. Meanwhile, Vic and Claudia were discussing a deal that would get them out from under Walter Flynn for good. Claudia is an extremely calculated chess player, which has been established ever since season 1 when she made a move with Dahlia. She described herself as a house cat, but it did come with certain benefits. 
One of the key elements in the game is networking, having relationships with the right people because you never know when they can come in use. For example, Rock once told you sometimes it's not such a bad idea to have law enforcement on your side, which was in reference to Detective Berg. The same could also be said about Claudia's case, except she nurtured relationships with various suppliers. One in particular agreed to give her all the Oxy, Zenny, and Adderall she could unload, but also similar to season 1, she needed help with distribution. In season 1 we learned about Claudia's vision and her ability to get her hands on the right product, although distributing the product wasn't her forte, which is why she approached Tommy and which is why she needed Vic on board. But Vic had already positioned himself inside Walter Flynn's organisation, and he said he was the one who was best placed to destroy their father. So Claudia had to give him a motive to come on board, which was Gloria's bar. Now after he saw what Walter Flynn did by turning Gloria's old bar into a gentleman's club, he was on board. Claudia's next plan was to make a deal with Merkovic and the Serbian network, an enemy of the Flynn's. But word was out that the Flynn's were on their way out, and nobody bore the sinking ship. However, Claudia did come to the sit down by doing her homework. She knew the Crimson Projects was high on the radar for Merkovic, which she did play on. She told Merkovic Diamond and Jannard were closer than ever, also running a shell game with the territory Jannard promised him. She also made reference to the territory Merkovic lost to the prisons to the CBI, which was Rojas. Balls will get you through the door. Brains will keep you in the room. In complete contrast to Walter Flynn, Merkovic said Claudia did have some big balls, and she certainly has brains. Although as I mentioned before, she may have the vision and the brains, she still needed help with distribution, hence a partnership offer. Now, later that evening, Walter Flynn did meet with Brendan Doyle, where he gave him an envelope himself. However, Doyle knew exactly what he was doing by telling Walter Flynn Uncle Paulie was a good man by dropping him off an envelope to buy him some more time. Brendan Doyle would love nothing but to see Walter Flynn fail, because I do think he has eyes on taking over Chicago, or if Vic was to take over, he can control him in ways he can't with Walter. But as it dawned on Walter Flynn, Uncle Paulie went behind his back. He was about to make a move that would lose him the only man who stuck by his side. Uncle Paulie's loyalty is second to none, but drunk Walter Flynn stumbled to Uncle Paulie's house and shat all over him. He said the only reason why he gave him a job was because his wife asked him to give his sister's husband a role with the Flynn's, but Paulie reminded him the role that he has and always will play, protect the family and protect their organisation. Although Walter didn't see it that way, in the street and drug game, reputation is a currency that holds extreme power and influence. Law 5 from the 48 Laws of Power reminds us, so much depends on your reputation, you have to guard it with your life. For Walter Flynn, reputation is like life or death, and in his eyes, all Uncle Pauly did was tarnish it, which he considered betrayal, and also made him look weak. Now to be fair to Walter, I do see this from his perspective in terms of keeping his reputation intact. Although there's also a good cause to be made, Uncle Pauly was just looking out for his best interests. But one thing is for sure, Walter has just gone and lost the last person who was in his corner. Now what Walter Flynn has done is push everybody away, Uncle Pauly, Vic and Claudia. However, the biggest danger for Walter Flynn still does loom around the corner. Seeing what Walter Flynn did to the memory of Gloria in regards to a bar was the motivation he needed to get on board with Claudia's vision. Although he wasn't thrilled with working with the Serbs, and rightly so. Let's not forget who assassinated Gloria in season 1, it was the Serbs. So Vic wanted blood and so did Claudia, because she knew the Serbs partnership didn't come with some level of risk. So her plan was to use the Serbs and build back up, and when the time was right, eliminate every single one of them. But at this moment in time, they needed them. It's a classic move that we have heard and seen so often in power. Infiltrate an enemy's organisation from the inside. Learn everything there is to know, get the connection to the boss, take out the leader of their organisation and take their place. However, if Walter got wind of their plan, Claudia and Vic may have just dug themselves their own graves. This is why Claudia didn't want to give Walter Flynn a second to breathe. Walter Flynn is a wounded animal at this moment in time. And if they gave a wolf time to heal, they'd, they'd find him snarling over them in their sleep. Now what Claudia is proposing is a daring move, a move that would kill Walter Flynn with quickness rather than the slow death Vic is giving him. No doubt, they wouldn't be able to do this on their own, and Brendan Doyle along with Dublin may have a part to play, but will this backfire? I think we all know Walter Flynn is on his way out, but he is damn sure not going to go down without a fight, and as we've all seen with other characters in power, even if you kill them, their influence and power still does remain. So will it be the same for Walter Flynn? If Claudia and Vic carry out this daring move, will it backfire?